This is examining future tech uh, through game world representations. So this is part of the Mages Track Music and Gaming Education Symposium. It's a subset of MAGFest where we do a lot of educational content. Um, this presentation is a derivative of a paper that I wrote with some colleagues for HCI, uh, Human Computer Interaction International this year. Um, but kind of to spur discussion and things like that because we were all interested in games. So just to give you a little bit of background of like who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, so I finished a bachelor's in computational media, which is a mix between computer science and digital media studies. And then uh, after that, I worked as a full-time researcher at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. Um, and during that time, I worked on my master's in human computer interaction with a focus on computing. Um, so some of the projects that I did when I was a researcher there uh, were different gaming applications like Games for Good, augmented reality, and different things like wearables. And the presentation today is based off of a paper that was published this year. I have the citation right here, um, but it was published in HCII. Uh, but I can go back to anything. So the gist of this presentation, um, here are a couple of main ideas and we'll elaborate on them. But initially I'd like to provide, the purpose of this presentation is to provide a framework or kind of a lexicon for talking about the technologies that we see as demonstrated in games, whether those things that the user, that we as players use, or we use indirectly as characters in games and stuff like that. A lot of science fiction, um, does a really good job of looking at like what can we learn from technology and what does uh, fictional technology borrow from the real world and vice versa. So applying that to games. Um, so media reflects our own understanding of technology and how we currently interact with it. Um, how we could design and interact with things in the future. Um, everything in a game is um, to use lack of a better word, contrived. It's all deliberately designed, it's not inherent. That all comes from us and our point of reference of what we know and what we imagine. Um, HCI, or Human Computer Interaction Principles, are useful in examining uh, these general technologies that operate in the real world, as well as fictional game worlds, and the ways that we interact between them, because we do use technology to access these digital worlds and some of these technologies that you know may not exist in physical form now, but are in some sense, you know, real and we're experiencing them through another way and could, you know, something like it could be real as we're working toward things. Um, so yeah, we can make, we can t make terminology and words to kind of talk about these things and be able to relate them back to what we know. Um, and technologists uh, can examine uh, future tech concepts and video games like we can learn from what happens if we let people play around with this or what if we make a world where everybody is augmented with cybernetic parts or everybody does you know use a certain thing like what would that look like it's an interesting thought experiment it's very pertinent to you know as technology is progressing at a very fast pace so just to lay some groundwork, some terms and conditions that I might be using in here, human computer interaction or HCI. Um, it's how we design technology so that it works well with people and has optimal outcomes for users and others who are potentially affected by it. So when we're looking at this, we're saying, we're looking at the people that are using the technology and kind of you know, adding them into the equation of how are they going to actually use this stuff? Because people never use it the way that you intend them to, but you want to, you know, the purpose of technology is to help augment people's abilities and we want to do that to the best we can by mi and mitigating harm. Um, as well as UX or user experience, you might have heard this in industry like UX designer or generalist. Um, this is kind of a subset of HCI. Um, so what it's like, what it's like to engage with a piece of technology. When you pick something up, even if you just look at it, like you are somehow interacting with a piece of technology. Um, so in games, we could refer to a few possible user types. Um, but a couple of principles of UX that I have listed here are things like usability, like learnability, like how easy is it for you to pick this thing up and to use it. Um, effectiveness, like is it doing its job? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Is the can opener actually opening the can or is it just like doing something it's not supposed to? 
Um, social acceptability is a big thing, especially in wearable computing. Um, I think we're a little, you know, over time we've become more accustomed to people wearing things, but you know, it was definitely weird to see somebody walking around with a big backpack or, you know, it took us a while to learn that somebody with a Bluetooth headpiece was not talking to us. They were much too important for that. So <laughs> that's, a, that's kind of what I'm referring to with UX here. And then as far as diegetic or non-diegetic diegesis, that's actually kind of a film terminology, a uh, film term. Uh, and that kind of means actual or belonging to a game world. So can occupants in a fictional world perceive sights and sounds that the player can perceive? Like if you're flipping through a, member, a menu in Skyrim, I don't think any of the farmers can really see what you're doing. And if they are, they're breaking the fourth wall. Um, so something that would be diegetic in the world would be like any items that a a player character uses, versus non-diegetic might be a health bar. Like, Link knows how much he hurts, but he can't tell you, like, I hurt exactly, I have exactly one half heart left, and that's it. Um, that's for our purposes. So diegetic and non-diegetic things can pertain to us or, you know, the um, virtual worlds. Um, so yeah, non-diegetic is not belonging to the game world. Uh, things like overlay music, user interfaces for players, um, Usually when music comes up in a battle, um, the person who's fighting it in the game world probably can't hear it. That's for you. That's to make you anxious, um, not them. They're already pretty, I mean, they're there, they're anxious. Um, and then just augmented reality, um, what I'm setting the line in the sand for that, that's the real world with digital elements and overlays. So augmented reality is what you see in the real world, but things like, you know, Google Glass was an example of that. Um, Pokemon Go is kind of an example of that, where you have like a feed of like real world camera, but then you're just placing things on top of it. Kind of like how they used to animate uh, cartoons with cells, where they would have part of it translucent and part of it uh, drawn in. Like AR is that drawn in part over the world that you're seeing. And then VR is when everything is digital. Like that is full visual, like you are not looking at anything in the real world in that case. That's just to clarify that point because um, sometimes that can be confusing of like, those things can start to blur and merge together, especially as you load on more AR elements. So this first checkpoint is a point earlier that media reflects our own understanding of tech, how we currently interact with it, and how we could design and interact with things in the future. Nothing exists in a vacuum. Um, so this is a diagram that's kind of showing the relationship of you know, video game tech and video game worlds as opposed to the real world. And this is derived from a film theory paper that was talking about you know, looking at science fiction film and TV shows, like Star Trek is a really good example of how things, how the real world informed the design of items um, in, the, in uh, the virtual world. And then those kind of things, people got inspired by those and then started making technologies that looked like that. Like communicators in Star Trek looked really, really like flip phones. Like you could almost, I mean, if somebody photoshopped Samsung on the side of one of those, you, I, would, I would believe it. Um, so the, yeah, this is looking at video games pull from existing tech, but then it's kind of the cyclical thing that happens where we have this feedback loop of you know, the real world is inspiring designers to create the things that are in the virtual world. And then those things are inspiring, you know, actual tech designers of, oh, well, that is an interesting use case, or that could be a cool thing if we made it. And in that way, there's kind of like this continuous, like, giving back to each other loop. So we draw inspiration and references from the real world to apply to fictional tech, and we use fictional tech to inform our designs of real world tech. And another point of this is HCI principles are useful when we're looking at this relationship. It's a way for us to describe who the players are in this you know, relationship and how they interact with each other. Uh, so we can apply the ways we already understand to talk about technology. Like HCI is widely used to talk about real technology now. Um, we can apply that to things that are not completely in the real world, at least not yet. Because a lot of things that we see, you know, could be right around the corner. And we are the ones that we are, are designing and, dis and you know, picking out what that looks like. 
So human can refer to a player that can be a real user like you and me in the real world on my couch usually with a cat on my lap in my case. Um, a character or an avatar, so that's Link, that's Master Chief, that's any of those people that you as the player are personifying in the digital world or in you know that world, like Hyrule. Like you are Link in Hyrule in that case, but you are also you on the couch because your soul hasn't like, not yet, but your soul hasn't like beamed up to you know Link. You die in the game, you die for real. Um, <laughs> or it can be an abstract representation of virtual space, like cursors, or like especially in point and click games, like you're kind of disembodied in that case. Or like Tetris, like who is the god hand in Tetris? What does that look like? That's not really defined, that's up to you. Um, so the, a human in this case can, doesn't necessarily have to be human per se as in like homo sapiens sapiens, but it's the intelligent agent that is interacting with things. Uh, so yeah, a real human player can be kind of abstract or separated from that world. Like we are kind of separated from that game world because we aren't like plugged in matrix style yet. Um, and that can be a third person omniscient. Like if you're playing something like civilization, you're kind of out and looking over the world and you're not really in it, but you're still interacting with that world or it's first person limited. Like you are Link running around, but you are limited to Link's point of view in that world. Um, oh no, sorry, first person limited, I mean, is like first person shooters. Like it's more of you and you are kind of in there. What I meant with the other is embodied or integrated, which is you are playing the part of a character. You are embodying that person and that is your means of getting around the world. I distinct, I separate character from avatar here because a character is usually defined by the game developers. That's something that's not really customizable. Like you can share aspects with a character and relate to them. Really good characters are very relatable. Um, but an avatar would be something more like maybe The Sims or if you were playing an MMO and we're putting on you know, you're choosing what your character looks like and how they act and picking all the gear that looks nice but isn't really effective, but you know what, you die pretty. So those are the kind of me like ways that we can talk about who is the user or the human in this relationship with technology as far as when we're in control. Now, a lot of these game worlds are also inhabited by other people and those are NPCs. Um, those can be interactable, like your squad mates in Mass Effect. You're talking to them, you're issuing commands, and you're getting feedback from them. You're, you know, you're creating relationships with them, or you're breaking them. Uh, or they can be ambient, like there's a lot of, I don't know who hires the extras for all these games, but like, I don't know, like a lot of games where there's just somebody walking around, what? Uh, well, those are actually interactable in a way, but on a very, primal level because you could kill them. But um, ambient, I mean, like, if you think about something like any of the Star Wars games, there's probably plenty of galactic citizens that you don't even see, or you might see them flying around in cars elsewhere, but they're still driving those cars. And so they are users, but you may not necessarily interact with them, but they make that world alive in a way. Um, and then when we're talking about interaction, that's uh, the computer or the technology of interest. So that can be, you know, any kind of technology. It doesn't necessarily have to be a computer. Um, and that can be various form factors or types of technology uh, described by uh, the dimensions of another framework that I'm going to talk about next. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? We can elaborate on things as well. Not everybody at once. Okay, I can always go back to stuff. Yeah. Um, like, well, actually, no, I'll ask this other question. Okay, what about, like, the non player characters that are basically like the, the mushrooms in Super Mario versus non player characters that behave humanly like your opponents? <laughs> um, 
Well, those are different kinds of users. Like, I wouldn't say that the enemies in Mario are necessarily users of technology, but in a game, in a game like Civilization, other NPCs are, have access to the same things that you do. So you are interacting with each other through different means, if that clarifies that. So the next point here is we can make a lexicon using pre-existing ideas in HCI to talk about tech, both real and speculative, because they do impact each other. And you know it's good for us to look at these things even if they're not here yet because we're the ones that define them. So let's make a set of tools and technology to talk about this. Um, we'll be using examples in gaming, but these can be applicable to other types of media as well. You can see I've already borrowed from like film theory for a lot of these. Um, so kind of looking at, uh, the heart of this paper is looking at um, like creating a set of you know, categories and describers and adjectives of ways that we can talk about uh, the things that we see. So with contextualization we're talking about like how is the presence of a technology explained in a game world? Like, why does this thing exist? Um, does it exist for us, the players? Does it exist to help us play the game? Does it exist for the people who live in this virtual world, or is it both? Um, is it part of the lore of the world? Like, are characters aware of it? Or is it only known to us, the player, because it's only meant for us? Um, as far as information type, like, what type of information is being conveyed and in what ways, uh, if any, a lot of technologies are used to convey information. That's the heart of what user interfaces are for. Uh, what is the purpose of the technology to the player, which is us, or the character that's in that world? Um, how complex is the technology and the information it conveys, the level of detail? It could be something as easy as, um, you know, I'm the equivalent of a metal detector to go dig for something, or it could give you a whole lot of information and why, what instances would you want a lot of information and what times would you not want much at all? Um, level of abstraction, um, how literal or abstract is the technology? Is it something that's rooted on or based on something that we have or is it something that's just kind of floating out there more in a fantastical or like separated from a way? If you think about it like realism versus cartoony or something like that. Like cartoony is more abstract, but you get the idea of what it's supposed to be. Uh, that's kind of what we're talking about here is that level of fidelity. Um, and how abstract is the information that it presents? Uh, what is the level of realism or plausibility? Is this something that you know, feels fairly grounded and you know, rooted? Um, or is it something that's kind of on a peripheral level you only need to know a little bit? Um, visual integration with the environment. This is especially pertinent with augmented reality. Um, is the technology situated or like tethered in the environment or is it overlaid? So if you're playing something like a first person shooter, uh, you can usually see your number of ammo clips, your health, things like that. Those are kind of in the corners. Those are not really rooted in the environment because wherever you're looking in your frame of reference is always in the camera view, the camera being your eyes. Versus if you see, let's say you see an opponent or a, a crate that has things in it that might have a highlight in it, but you move around the crate and that highlight still stays around the crate. It doesn't move with your head. So that's what we're talking about with tethering or visual integration. Uh, thematic integration, does it kind of belong with the whole diegesis of the world? Um, is it designed to be cohesive with an overarching contextual theme like the Sheikah Slate in Breath of the Wild is very much a part of the lore and the technology of like, you know, it belongs there. It looks like some of the other Sheikah elements that are in there. It's very, you know, intentionally tied together. Um, yeah, is it diegetic? Uh, temporal conditions, do you have it on all the time? Can you control when it's on? Uh, does it only come on during certain contexts? Um, yeah, is it conditional? Um, things like that. And in that same vein, spatial conditions. Um, are aspects of the technology dependent on like how close or far you are from something? Like how close do you have to be for that crate to be highlighted? Um, sorry, uh, proximity to the objects or other users, NPCs, things like that. Because a virtual world, like, 
you know, we have great processing power now where we can render things quite far, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's very difficult to see something all the way across the map and the, the technology is not really gonna generate or trigger that until it's immediately pertinent to you. Like, I know that there's people in Europe that are making calls right now, but like, I just know that at an abstract level, like, I can more closely see like, you know, you guys, if you're using technology. Um, exclusivity, is it only accessible to a given user or can it be accessed by others in the space? And that includes other players, like if you're playing online, do you get to use the same things, especially like mods or add-ons, do you get to use the same things as other people? Um, or if you're in a very story-rich world, is your character, do they have access to some technologies that maybe um, your squaddies or your enemies don't? Um, does everybody have the equivalent of an iPhone in that world? Those kind of things, like how, how widespread is it? Um, personalization and customization, like is it specific to the user or is it generalized? Is it custom fit? Is it pertinent to your job or what you're trying to do or is it just a catch-all for everybody? Um, is it the same across users? Are you seeing the same interface as somebody else? Um, or is it customized based on, like, let's say your class? Is a tank gonna see the same thing as a stealth build? Um, and then automation and agency. Is the technology automatically activated or is it controlled by user actions? And this kind of goes into um, temporal and spatial conditions where like, are you the one that is initiating the use of technology or is it activating by itself? Like something will show up on the map automatically if it's of interest um, and that's not you doing it, but you get to decide whether you pull up the map in the first place a lot of times. Um, so yeah, what aspects of the technology can the user control, whether that's the character in the world, Link pulling out the Sheikah Slate, whether it's you, the player, who is adjusting things on your interface, um, things like that. Or other users, let's say somebody else had a Sheikah Slate, if they could trigger things. So the last point here before I go into some examples is that you know technologists and we as users, because in a way we're all kind of technologists, we think about the things that we use, um, can examine future tech concepts and video games, often in the form of science fiction artifacts and systems. And I say this without limiting it to necessarily science fiction genre, because we can look at interaction methods for any kind of artifacts in a lot of games. Um, so yeah, like I've already mentioned this before, but one of my favorite examples here is uh, Breath of the Wild. Um, the Sheikah Slate is a very integral part of your experience as the player, as well as the way that Link interacts with the world. So you can see here, like using the ice block um, to create these uh, entities of ice from water and you can tell in the marker like where you're going to build it. Um, you're manipulating real objects using things like magnetism. Uh, you're using something a little, maybe a bit more abstract with the map features. Um, I mean, you're documenting yourself on the camera, things like that. So let's break this down using those frameworks defining you know, the human, the computer, and the interaction in this instance of the Sheikah Slate as a whole. I'm talking about a bunch of the different functions that the Sheikah Slate has. So in this case, the human, uh, the human player is embodied as an in-game character, that's Link, with some degree of third-person perspective looking inwards on the game via the screen. So you as the player are looking at the screen and that field of view is limited to the character that you embody. So the player control character is narratively tied to the game world and uses the technology in this context. Like any of the menus and things you use, you know, are in the Sheikah Slate. And we can assume that Link can probably see some of those things too. Like he wouldn't take pictures if he couldn't review them later. He's not taking them for God. Uh, and then the computer in this case is, yeah, the Sheikah Slate. Um, it's a tablet device that fits in the playable character's hands and allows the player through the character to manipulate aspects of the physical world and receive information by means of augmented reality features. Um, so yeah, this is a really cool use case of augmented reality because we're seeing reality of Hyrule here, like 
this virtual world is real to Link and your embodied character, but there's overlays here that maybe another person couldn't see or that, you know, it's ways that Link is using technology to interact with elements of the world, whether indirectly, like through taking pictures or directly through manipulating objects. So let's break down, you know, we've talked about the players and the relationship of the game, so let's describe that technology a little bit more and see how it relates to what we actually use. So as far as contextualization, um, the tech exists as part of the lore in the game. Like the Sheikah Slate is something that people address in the game and it is diegetic, like it exists there, but it's also real for you as the player, it's a mechanism. Uh, so this technology was developed by the Sheikah people of Hyrule as explained by narrative and design cues, like it's called the Sheikah Slate. Um, and it has like the emblem of the game role group, like any of the shrines you go to look very visually similar. The sounds are fairly similar when you activate things. Um, I don't know, the Sheikah kind of took a cue from Apple and made everything ver talk to each other very, very well. I don't know how their networks still work, it's amazing. Bluetooth. It's Bluetooth. It's literally blue. <laughs> uh, as far as information type, um, the purpose of the technology is to provide information to the player's in-game character, that's Link, that's stuff for him to do on his adventure. Um, and provide a means of interacting with items in the physical game world, that's magnetism, ice formation, uh, time freeze. Uh, information is conveyed on the device screen, which acts as a user interface for the player, and augmented reality artifacts, which are overlaid and integrated into the environment. So Link can be looking at the screen at things, like a map, through the screen for something like a camera, or like he doesn't really have the slate in his hand where he's not looking directly at the slate when he's using things like magnetism moving things around. Um, as far as level of detail, there's singular levels of detail available um, for most features. Like some features allow more detail on demand uh, or for the player to add or remove details. So with the map, you can highly customize the map and you can place beacons in the world, things like that. That's super customizable. Um, so yeah, the map can zoom, it can show information based on focus, um, set and remove waypoints, things like that. But with magnetism, you know, it only highlights items that are immediately pertinent and you can't really change like how magnetized things get or how frozen in time things get. That those are kind of set presets. Um, so level of, of abstraction. Uh, the physical form of the device in the game world is pretty literal. It's a tablet on a portable screen. Um, visual integration, some AR elements are situated in the environment. Those are your overlays and your highlights. Like in this example, uh, when you're using time freeze on the rock, like that's an overlay on the rock in that world. Um, while others are overlaid as general GUI or graphical user interface elements, like the weather indicator or an icon on a map or showing you what tool is currently equipped, that's for you. So yeah, screen elements such as the map and the photo album are overlaid on the screen, but those are, are understood to be displayed on the in-game device. Like Link is looking through his photos on the slate. Um, thematic integration, yeah, the device and its features are designed to coincide thematically with the other ancient Sheikah technology in the game world, like everything interacts with each other. Uh, that's primarily in aesthetics like color, shape, sound design, like all of those things are kind of integrated and it ties that technology more into the world. Uh, temporal conditions, um, passive information like weather forecast, the map, and item shortcuts are present continuously during gameplay unless actively disabled by the human player via the in-game menu system. So those are things that are kind of like passively letting you know like notifications or you know the clock on your iPhone is still running in the background like the weather forecast is still being shown unless you change it. Um, contextually relevant information such as selected objects of interest like when you um, when you time freeze things um, those appear as long as the current feature is actively in use. So for a time freeze this yellow highlight and the arrow of force 
Um, those are only going to show up as long as you are manipulating that object or before it runs out. With magnetism, it can be however long you have the thing active. With the time skip, that's like you have a set time to have that thing frozen in time, and then it starts over. So you have some control over what it is, but not necessarily how long. So that varies. Spatial conditions, so passive information is shown regardless of spatial criteria. So feature-specific indicators are restricted to the operable space in which said feature can be used. Like, if you're looking at, you know, the area and you want to use the time freeze feature, um, it's only going to show you what is immediately um, clickable or selectable by the time skip feature in your current field of view. Like, if you're in the middle of Hyrule Field, it's not going to show you all of the things that you can interact with in the Zora domain, because that's not really relevant to you right now. It's kind of confined to the space of what are you close enough to that you can interact with. Uh, exclusivity, the technology can be used by whomever is currently in possession of the device. So I don't think there's a way for Link to lose this in the game, and other than plot reasons. I don't see anybody else walking around with this, except for Zelda in a couple of flashbacks. But somebody else could pick this up and use it, unless it's like Touch ID activated. I don't know how tied this is. Like, I don't know if Link has a passcode on this thing, because you're not having to unlock it every time you pull it out, especially if you need it in an emergency. So yeah, information and features appear only to be accessible to the immediate user, that's you as the player, or Link as the user in the world, unless deliberately shared. So that would be like, um, I think there's an instance where Zelda is walking around with it and she shows Link something like some pictures. Like she is sharing that information that is exclusive to her with somebody else by like physically showing him. Uh, personalization and customization, uh, the design and interfaces appear to be designed for a general audience. It doesn't go, bing, hello Link, welcome back. Um, it doesn't really recognize that, it's just whoever picks it up is, it's the same, whoever uses it. Uh, but features like photography and map editing allow you to capture set and remove information. So your map is probably gonna look different from somebody else's, especially if you have the feature where it shows you how many and where you died because mine is gonna be a lot higher than a lot of yours. And then automation and agency. So pervasive augmentations displaying general information such as like the game world clock appear automatically, but those can be turned off in the settings menu. Uh, the user can control when and how most features are used, but augmentations related to the active feature appear automatically. So you're only going to th see things pertinent to time freeze when you're using time freeze. Um, but you can see things like your map at any time because that's always relevant to you. So another example that I really like is the Varia or Varia tomato tomato suit of Metroid, especially the Metroid Prime series. They do some really cool tricks with their user interface. Um, so I imagine the Varia suit as a wearable computing system which also implements augmented reality, but, you know, in a different way. Um, it's a wearable computing system with contextually aware AR capabilities. So in this case, the human is still you as the player, but in this case, it's Samus um, on, I think, Talon 4 in the first Metroid Prime. Um, and her interaction is, is she's inside of the technology that she's using. So that's a very different interaction style. And you as the player kind of get to experience what it's like to wear a wearable computer by embodying this character in this wearable you know, technology. So yeah, how can Samus interact with the suit and the world through it or in it? Like, we don't really know how she's pulling up things like maps. Um, we know that as the player for our own purposes, but if you were actually Samus in this world, or if you had the equivalent of a various suit in the real world, like how would you pull up the map? Is that like a gesture kind of thing? Do you like clap to get the map to come on? Is it something that it's like voice activated that says like, okay. Yeah, that's very efficient when, yeah, when you're trying to shoot something, map. But yeah, those are questions of like, if we're implementing wearable technology, like especially if 
your hands are busy or one of them is inside of a cannon, how do you pull up these different features because you still want to use these things? Um, yeah, how can we interact with the suit and the game world from our position in real life? Like, this game does a really good job of integrating like these diegetic elements of like you're looking through the visor. The visor even fogs up and everything. But anything that you see in the you in kind of the primary, you know, frame of this, we're assuming that that's what it's like to be inside the suit. And that's how the developers designed this technology to be. Um, yeah, like there's a mini map in the top, but how do you pull that down? So I think that's a really cool thought experiment to look at, you know, what would it be like if we made the various suit real? Um, not gonna worry about like temperature and bathroom and human functioning because you don't have to take bathroom breaks in Metroid. Um, another favorite example of mine is the Omni tool in Mass Effect. It is very cool. I would love to have one, but I have no idea how it works. Um, so yeah, looking at the contextualization, like in this case, most people in the Mass Effect universe do have an Omni tool. Like the cashiers at the shops that you go to have an Omni tool. The people that you're fighting have Omni tools. Like that is their primary comms device and that's the personal computer that everybody has. But like, what does it look like? Is there like a module on your arm that you keep to have it pop up? Like, do, is everybody outfitted with lenses that you can see those holograms? Um, I'm gonna save questions until a little bit later, but please hang on to that. Um, yeah, like the information type, in this case, the Omni tool can you know show you UI elements, but in this case, we're seeing it used a lot for just teleconferencing. Like, that's what this is for. This is like Skype of the future. Um, level of detail, uh, things like that, like, there's, you know, it's pretty high visual detail, but um, in this case, it's usually only focusing on whoever is talking. Like, it's not capturing the entire room because you don't really need to, like, see where they are. It's like when you're on a Skype call, you usually have your face obfuscate anything else around your area. Um, you have the technology focus in on that one thing. Um, visual integration with the environment, like there's a lot of AR elements, but it kind of, you know, it situates and sizes the people in teleconferencing so that you're kind of there with them for the most part. There's a couple examples where like, there's a little, you know, you're my only hope kind of comes up there, but most of the time it's, you know, your same size. Um, temporal conditions, like usually when you're pulling it up, it's like a gesture where like, it's not activating on its own. The method of, you know, having it activate is like you're doing an arm gesture like an Apple Watch to like raise to use. Um, spatial conditions are kind of the same thing. Like when are you triggering that? Um, exclusivity, um, we see a couple of examples of, uh, people using Omni tools volleying parcels of information to one another. Like you can send something like a payment. Like that's how you pay for things when you go to, it's Apple Pay, when you go to the store in Mass Effect. Um, and there's also instances where an Omni tool user will share the info displays with others as larger projections. So like in the middle right, um, Jacob is showing like the schematic of the base that you're looking at, but everybody else around the table can see it, but he's kind of in control of the PowerPoint clicker. Um, but that's kind of being run on his thing, but he's choosing to have everybody see it. Whereas like, yeah, and then with the video call with the elusive man. Um, but you could easily see instances where like only, if you're having a private call, you could be the only one that sees it and just be talking to your arm. Um, personalization and customization, like, uh, is the experience same across users? Like, I don't imagine that uh, many of the cashiers at the stores are gonna be equipped with Omni blades. Like, how do you get licensed to use an Omni blade versus something else? Um, what functions do vanilla Omni tools come with out of the box? Like, what do smartphones come with that are the basic necessities? It's definitely a lot more things than 10 years ago. Like, what are the needs of people in the future? Um, and then automation and agency. Is it automatically activated or is it controlled by users? Like we see a lot of interactions initiated by, yeah, that raising arm thing to like initiate. 
uh, or like to answer a call or like a solicitation to interact. Like when your phone buzzes, like that's a solicitation for you. It's a passive one, but to interact, it's giving you a bid to interact with it. And that's that human computer interaction starting. Um, but yeah, some safety features could be automated um, as well. Like if you have environmental sensors, like you're not picking when the smoke detector goes off. Um, you're also not picking in that scene when the elusive man just decides to kind of push his call through. And then like another example that I like is from a game that came out last year. Um, uh, God, I am losing it. Uh, Astral Chain, thank you. This is on my playlist. Um, but yeah, you can see this is a different context. Like, this is wearable tech. This is a, a wearable piece of technology, and there's augmented reality, and there's some similarities. But you can also pick out the differences. The context of this is that you're a police officer. Um, you're not really like a soldier necessarily, because you use it for a lot of other things, like recording information, um, all kinds of stuff. So you can use these terminal, like these frameworks, to talk about like and compare. You know, how is the wearable device in Astral Chain like? What about that is different than like the Omni tool in Mass Effect? And like, what do we want to borrow from one versus the other? What does one do better than the other? Or what are some things that if we put them together, that would be a good way? Like, that's why it's useful to see like many different instances of similar technologies as well to see like, you know, let's have some competition. Like, what are things that we want from each of those things? Um, another, well, why, I don't know why the, video isn't playing. Is that on click? It is. Uh, so this is from Dead Space, um, but this one also integrates it into the environment. So this is like working across layers, serving literal gameplay and hypothetical user purposes. Um, so like the wearable indicator system, initially I thought, well, why? I get why it's on the person's back because they're a mechanic. I get why it's on their back for me as the user, but what about the guy in the suit? And then I realized, well, that particular interface may not be for the person in the suit. It may be for the other people that this mechanic is working with. Instead of just asking, are you OK? Are you OK? Are you OK? Like, this ambiently shows anybody else, if there was anybody else alive on this ship, um, you know, what the status of this person is. So, you know, sometimes the user can be passive or in the environment in that way. So like another mechanic could be interacting with this technology even though they're not the one wearing it because they're pulling information from it that's pertinent to them. Um, and then yeah, the UI system in this is I think really cool because it, you know, is very situated and whatever, you know, the play the player sees is what the character sees, but it's also a horror game so that artificially kind of narrows your scope because you're not supposed to be omniscient and know everything or else it isn't scary. Oh, come on now. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up these things, like we're talking about, you know, we can describe the human or the users in relationships and that can be us or the player or the characters that we play as. Those can be other entities that are moving around in that space. Um, the computer is any kind of technology or any kind of artifact of interest. And the interaction is the way that all of those things relate to each other. Um, and then we can use these metrics to describe what that relationship looks like in a little bit finer detail. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open up the, f we have about 15 minutes left. I'd like to open up the floor to discussion um, if anybody would like to provide any input or to kind of talk about some of these things, like what are some technologies that you see that you think are really cool examples of like you'd like to see in the real world or things where it's like that would be great in this game world, but in the real world it would be horrible. Like um, I have another microphone up somewhere. I may even just, I'm going to break the rules and like come down on the floor. Okay, so I can, I guess, kind of come around and take. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to share about any of this stuff? I know there was somebody before. Yes? Uh, it's not out yet, but particularly with Cyberpunk 2077, have you paid any attention to any of the sort of 
uh, technology in there that makes <laughs> No, that's cool. So just to sum up, um, you were talking about Sire 20... 2077. 2077. I, I always want to say like 2048. Um, but yeah, there is a piece of technology that's situated augmented reality where this person is putting on makeup and the makeup is, I guess, applying itself or like making it look like, you know, what it would be. Is it actually applying it or is it kind of like an Instagram filter? Uh, an NBC, just what they do. Yeah, like that's, yeah, that's somebody living in this world. That, like, that's probably a day-to-day -day thing, and you could imagine like somebody driving in their car. There are people who put on their makeup while they're driving in the car, but this could do it for them, or like in the house. Like, I don't know exactly how that would work, but like I have seen things like uh, some prototypes for augmented reality. Um, in mirrors. So some of these kind of technologies, like we have the pieces of them starting to kind of come up. Um, a lot of them are, you know, trial and error in academia because they don't really hit the big time. They're proofs of concept. But like, yeah, that's something that I think is really cool because that would be a very wide use case and thinking about like, you know, what are the ways that you would want to see that come to fruition versus something that's not? Like, would you want somebody to hack that and then screw up your face? Or could you have a system that would recommend, like, today is going to be overcast. Like, I really think that you're an ochre color today. Like, that kind of thing. So that's a really good point. I'm going to have to keep an eye on that. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes? Like, something I've noticed in, like, some of these interactions, some of these user interfaces, like for the um, for the example you brought up with um, the Sanko suit, mm -hmm. is that it would not be possible for the actual character to interact with that thing because they just don't have enough arms. But you, as the player, are on a keyboard and mouse, and you can push whatever buttons you feel like. And therefore, that particular interaction, that that thing, it, you can't do it like that. But the player has different user interface, mm -hmm. and therefore that's why it works. Yeah, so that's something that like in HCI we talk about is affordances, which is like ways that something can afford itself or like lend itself to using, like a bar lends itself to grabbing. A controller with buttons, the buttons afford themselves to pushing, but Samus doesn't have those, so like in the case of, yeah, somebody walking around with a wearable, we're gonna have to rethink how we interact with things like you know, we're very accustomed to using things with our hands, but there's plenty of uh, input mechanisms that use things like your tongue or, you know, your toes or anything like that. Or even just like, I mean, someday we could probably read brain waves at some point. Um, like, yeah, that really pushes the boundaries of like, you know, this doesn't exist yet for some of those limitations, but what are ways that like, yeah, what are the new ways in which people will interact with things so we can do things? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, you sort of started answering the question as, yeah, as you were talking. The whole idea of that is that as we develop these wearable technologies, is what are the input parameters? How do we tell the device to do something? Exactly. Whether it's vocal, whether it's a gesture, whether it's like you said, you move your tongue a certain way. In terms of how the technology is progressing, where is that going? I mean, I know there have been experiments in neural feedback and the ability of essentially being able to think an action, be able to generate a, uh, a response. But, you know, is that the way, is that the direction that technology is going, or is there going to be some, some sort of intermediate, um, I'm trying to remember the word, you know, action based interface? I don't really know because there's a bunch of different branches of research that are, you know, exploring ways to optimize ways that we currently interact with things, like how to multi-encode buttons, like, 
you can have a button just do on off or you could do it gradiated or you could do certain sequences like there are ways to push the boundaries of what we already have but there's also things that like we haven't even thought of yet yeah like blinking or you know wiggling something or there's a button in your teeth like all kinds of stuff that we haven't really thought of so yeah there's a lot of different branches of research that are looking at you know extending what we already have as well as exploring options that we haven't really used yet so I don't really know but it'll be exciting to see and like I don't know that's part of us is like do how do we want to control things especially when it comes to like social acceptability like someday I could be sitting here and everybody's typing by going and it's like that's perfectly acceptable to just walk around going because it's normal because now this is normal you know like things change over time I mean please don't look at your phone when you're crossing the street, but yeah, that's another thing entirely. Yes? Um, so I know uh, in the past when, when the cell phone came out, and yeah, they were thinking about interaction with the cell phone, and like, remember there's this first wave where they tried to mimic action with their life, and just in a space, and they were like, can it quite translate as well? Can? Mm -hmm. So the problem, just so I understand the problem of translating like literal ways of, literal physical ways of doing things uh, from like more abstract actions. Yeah. Yeah, and that gets into like different kinds of haptics or, yeah, it's exactly, the key phrase is mental model, and I'm really glad you mentioned that. Because, like, that's that whole, you know, the real world, that is our mental model, and that is our reality, informs the reality that we make in the game, and then that, you know, creates some kind of a mental model, like you cite examples from fiction, um, because they're relevant to certain things, and that's that relationship with that, so, um, as far as developing a mental model, like, you know, we can borrow from what we already know, but I think we also have to think outside the box a little bit and think about, you know, there are some ways to translate inputs and things um, to a digital um, input. Like, there's some arcade games downstairs, like there's a skiing one that like, actual takes your left and right movement, and that's like a pretty literal way of translating that signal. But on something more abstract like a controller, that doesn't quite work. So yeah, how do we, you know, what is it about a pinch or a zoom versus something else? Like, you know, how do we learn those more abstract ways of using things and incorporate those into our mental model and vice versa? So thank you so much. Uh, you in the white shirt. I mean, we, uh, yeah, like eye tracking is currently used, um, like that's a big accessibility tool, is eye tracking, especially for people who may not be able to use both of their hands in a way that a technology is kind of demanding them to. Um, but yeah, that's something that like with VR, it's, you know, built in, but that would be like, it's my dad's dream to play a flight game where he can kind of look back and actually see stuff, even if it's, you know, not necessarily a VR headset, but you know, that's another means of input that we haven't even talked about. Like, you know, you can use your feet, you can use your head, you can use all these different things. So that would be, yeah, very cool to, you know, free up a hand for the camera and use your eyes and your head, which you're normally using. And that's part of that translating, you know, the mental model of when you look and turn your head, you expect your view to change. So that is a really cool thing. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, yes, you. So 
so the scope of this paper was not necessarily like an audit of those things, but it was just kind of like a framework to perform that kind of audit. Um, from my personal experience, like I do play quite a few Western games, but I do try and, you know, play some Japanese games as well. Like Astral Chain was developed by Platinum. Um, and Nintendo, which is, you know, more of a Japanese influence versus like Mass Effect was developed by Canadians. So like, yeah, that would be really useful to do an audit of like, you know, what does future technology look like compared to, you know, different places, different cultural contexts and use cases and things like that. We already see that in science fiction. Like, I wish we had cooler giant robots, but we don't. Um, but yeah, that would be really useful to do an audit and then, you know, to be able to describe these things and say like, yeah, compare these things and what do we want that to look like in an increasingly global world where we're going to see these technologies anyways. Quick time check. Thank you so much for bringing that up. We got five minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes, you in the back in the tan shirt. Hmm. Not off the top of my head. Um, oh no. Well, so in Metal Gear, in Metal Gear, in the Metal Gear series, um, Snake is wearing uh, a transcoder that's inside of his head, um, which you know we don't have implantable phones yet, but. I want to say that might use something like bone conduction, and you can buy a set of bone conduction headphones on Amazon for $100. We call those a bone phone. Um, <laughs> I love it, but it's a headpiece where it kind of sits on the side of your temple, so you, it frees up your ear canal so you, for, so you can hear what's around you. Like, snake should be able to hear what's going on, you know, he's stealthy, he's in a war zone, it's kind of important for him to hear those cues, but at the same time he has to be in contact with people who are giving him strategic information. And so that provides yet another avenue for input by using bone conduction where the sound waves are, you know, pressed up against your temple and go in. Like the bone phone um, doesn't, isn't great for music, but it's really good for like speech and phone calls. So I actually teleconference with a couple people who use them. So that's one that I kind of think of, but I'm sure there's others. Yes. So maybe the flip side of that question, do you have like a, a favorite, particularly unusual uh, UI uh, from a game that maybe doesn't have a real world in So a promising technology that doesn't really have a real world analog. Uh, it's hard to say if there's, I, I can't really think of anything that's super separate from reality because of that feedback loop of like, we create from what we know. Um, but I've always kind of had a fascination with how um, like full body capture of like movement and things like that, especially when like, as far as exhaustion, like if you're piloting something, how do you not get exhausted? Like I definitely spent time, you know, playing my Wii from the couch, which is not the intended use case, but it's like something that would allow for augmentation or control of something over long periods of time that may be rigorous, that would not tire somebody out. Like I think that would be a really cool thing to use. Yes, chunky. <laughs> Uh, as a photographer, it's something that's what I guess a lot. I would love to be able to just take a picture and then retroactively somehow context of the world outside of the frame of that photograph so I can you know, say, oh, I didn't like the frame, so let me rotate the camera after the fact. Actually, Apple One has a little bit of that one working with this live photos. Yeah. I just realized you can, uh, uh, yeah. if, if, if you got like an accidentally blurry photo, it's like, oops, uh, I'll just quickly rewind that. Like, half a second and disable there as well that. So, so the, thank you. So for the example on the recording, it was the, uh, what was it called? The, the zoom and enhance, the zoom and enhance analog that they use in Blade Runner, which is another science fiction uh, environment, which is kind of analogous to live photo, where if you don't catch a photograph in the moment, you can go back and it captures kind of a buffer space around it, so then you can work around it. So good point, hon. Yes. Uh, another technology that works with that is uh, something called light field camera. Those two users in the world today, um, they capture the future depth of work. 
have not been connected to the path of photons. So you can retroactively refocus uh, pictures. So this is called this is called the light. So a light field camera. That's really cool. So that's something that is, you know, extent to a certain extent now, but like that could be something that as the technology progresses could become something that is, yeah, becomes vanilla in a piece of technology that you buy. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, one more quick. I'm out. Okay. Y'all, I am out of time, but thank you so much for coming. If you'd like to continue the discussion, I will be here for a while. Um, this is my contact information. See how much I've neglected my games on the Switch because I'm a backseat driver. Um, but I would love to continue the conversation. So thank you so much for your time today and enjoy the rest of MAGFest.